As we continue our In Case You Missed It series, uh, this week I want to share with us about a series that we journeyed through as a church in the summer of 2015, and a series that defined a bit of an era for us as a church. It was a series called Bible Study. Um, in the years leading up to that series, uh, we had been sort of sensing together, uh, maybe noticing, experiencing, or maybe even sensing God's revelation around how uh, it seemed that people were becoming less and less familiar with the Bible. And yet at the same time, it, it seemed like people were often uh, fighting more and more often about the Bible, about what this book is, what to do with it, how to read it, and how to interpret it. And uh, those things were beginning to really break our hearts. And we were feeling convicted uh, as well about how some of those things might have been true about us and, and our community. Maybe uh, a, a biblical illiteracy of sorts or, or biblical infighting. And so we went into this journey we called Bible study. Now, uh, Bible study is something we talk about or hear about in a church context often as it's a significant part of our discipleship in following Jesus. Um, but this was a little bit different than just sort of studying different passages or content from the Bible. We we're actually inviting God to help us step back and study this book as a whole. Kind of better, be better informed and have a better appreciation of, of what it is and maybe overcome some misunderstandings about what it isn't in order to experience its full purpose in our lives and, and overcome that lack of familiarity or that infighting that we were noticing. And I think exactly eight years later in the summer of 2023, I feel like this, this conversation is probably as relevant today as it was then, if not more so. Because um, if you haven't noticed in the world we live in, maybe most prominently in, in the places like social media, not everybody agrees about what this book is and what we should do with it, whether we should read it or, or set it aside altogether. I was convicted by something uh, I came across that was uh, said by a New Testament scholar, Marcus Borg, in recent years, where he said this. He said that conflict about how to see and read the Bible is the single greatest issue dividing Christians in North America today. And the question that we sort of considered throughout the Bible study series, and the one we're going to revisit today is, does it have to be that way? Or is there a better underway, a better understanding, a better way to understand and a fuller way to understand what the Bible is so that we can experience God's revelation through it and participate in God's redemptive purposes for it together as a community? And in case you missed it, that's what Bible study was all about in 2015. And that's some of what I want to share with us uh, this week. So what I want to do is I want to do my best to share four key learnings from that series. Kind of, it'll, it'll be quite a bit we'll go through, but I'll try to summarize it as best as possible, the six-week series into four key learnings, and then also the crux and point of the series and the legacy it has had in our community since then. So first things first, the, the four learnings of our Bible study series. If you're taking notes, you may want to jot these down because they kind of set the stage for what this series was for us. And the first is that we learned that the Bible is both holy and human. That the Bible is both holy and human. Now, it probably comes as no surprise that we would describe the Bible as holy, uh, especially given that most Bibles in their title, as you can see on the binding on mine, actually say holy Bible. But, but what does that mean? Well, the word holy, it simply means uh, set apart. It means uh, something that has a special or unique or, or even sacred purpose. And throughout history, those that have engaged with the scriptures and, and within the church, they've confessed that it is, a, it is a holy, sacred book, that it has that kind of sacred place and purpose in our lives. And uh, the Bible says this about itself. The Apostle Paul described it this way, writing to his young protege, Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, he said, All scripture is God-breathed. Paul says that all of the scripture... It is God breathed. It's infused with the life and the breath and the voice of God. Um, this, this phrase, God breathed, it's actually where we get our word inspired. 
It's as though uh, the, this whole book is inspired by God, almost inspirited by his presence. And that's what, what makes it holy in our lives. But the Bible is also human. It has a human dimension to it. And the Bible describes that as well. Uh, the author of Hebrews, when they started their book in the New Testament, they started this way. They said, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. What the authors of the Bible understood is that God's inspiration came through real people at real times, in real places, in real contexts and, and languages, giving it a very human dimension. And this actually, this characteristic of the Bible being both holy and human, it actually parallels what we understand about the person of Jesus, who the church has always confessed is both fully holy and fully human all at the same time. And yet when it, it comes to the Bible, uh, it sometimes has seemed like, what we learn through Bible studies, that sometimes we seemed like it had to just be one or the other. Either the Bible was exclusively holy and therefore uh, had to appear fully free of any potential error or omission or contradiction. And if we would seem to come across any, we would just kind of put, put it out of our minds because it's fully holy. Or on the other hand, some would feel like, well, no, it's just exclusively human. It's just a, a book of the past and it's only as useful as ancient stories from the past can be. But when we studied the Bible together, we, we've come to see that the Bible is fully holy and fully human, actually inviting us into God's mysterious revelation um, to and through humanity in the pages of Scripture. So that was the first kind of core learning of the Bible study series, that the Bible is uh, both holy and human. Then secondly, uh, we learned that the Bible uh, navigates science and story. And this was really important for us to journey through because uh, in our modern age, um, there may be no greater ongoing fight than that between science and religion. Um, or on the one hand, you have uh, certain people of, of faith or religion or maybe of, of the Christian faith who feel like the Bible needs to be able to either prove or disprove any and all scientific theories. And so when we kind of come across scientific discoveries or theories that may at some way feel like they compete with some of our biblical interpretations, we feel like we just have to dismiss them. There's nothing we can learn from them um, because of how we interpret the Bible. On the other hand, there, there's certain people of, of science who feel like we need to completely discard religion or discard a book like the Bible because it seems to have such an ancient understanding of how the world works. Um, but as a book that is both holy, inspired by God, um, and human, written through and by real people in real places at real times, and get this, with real product of their times understandings of science, we can learn how the Bible actually can navigate and our use of the Bible can navigate any tension we may experience between science and the story of scripture. I'll give you kind of one relatively simple example of this from a line from one of the Psalms. Um, in Psalm 113, the psalmist said this, they said, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Now, what's the psalmist saying here? They're obviously using a, you know, a poetic image and description of the natural world, of, of their best observation and understanding of the orbital relationship between the sun and the earth, obviously one that we still use today. And ultimately to say um, that God is worthy of endless praise because of God's goodness. Now, that declaration that uh, invitation is not changed even though centuries later we would learn that uh, the sun doesn't actually rise or set at all because it's reflecting the science of its time. Similarly, this is true in the life and stories of Jesus as well. Chris, Chris Fowler uh, referenced this a couple of weeks ago when Jesus said, that the kingdom of God is like the smallest of seeds, the smallest seed they knew at the time, the mustard seed. And even though we've come to discover smaller seeds since, um, it doesn't refute 
the reality that Jesus was saying that God's kingdom comes through the smallest acts of love that grow and flourish over time. Because when in the conversation between science and scripture, what we have come to understand is that the Bible is a spiritual book, not seeking to be a scientific textbook, and so we shouldn't treat it that way, but a spiritual book that instead of seeking to primarily answer the questions of, of what and how of the natural world, the Bible speaks to questions like why and who of God's supernatural love for all things. And when we begin to understand how the Bible can navigate science and story, we then are free from feeling like the Bible requires us to engage in the fight between science and religion. So first we learn the Bible is holy and human. Next we learn the Bible navigates science and story. Uh, and third, we learned that the truth of the Bible transcends fact and fiction. I'm going to pause right there for a moment because I know uh, saying the word fiction uh, could sort of trigger in our spirit a sense that, that maybe the Bible says something that is untrue. Um, but I want us to reflect on this uh, in a few layers. First, I think it's worth for us as folks that, that engage with the scriptures to understand that, especially in some of its most ancient writings and stories, and sometimes in some comparison to modern uh, historical study or archaeology, there are some events recorded in the Bible that beg the question, did that actually happen? That for some, that is going to become a, a challenging question. And I think the first thing uh, that we learned in Bible study that's, that we need to continue to understand together is that um, writers of ancient history, including the writers in the Bible, um, didn't think about writing history the same way we do today in a, in a modern, fact-based, journalistic way, like just kind of tell me what happened. Far more uh, ancient writers of history wrote their histories uh, to transform, to have transformative power in shaping the lives of their audience. Even if, you know, the iPhone video on the scene might have revealed a few of the details slightly differently. And these stories were often long told in oral tradition, sometimes over decades before they were written down in their final form, growing into uh, the most transformative form and containing the deepest timely truth of the story to persist for all time. I'll give you one example um, that I'll share briefly. And if you ever wanted to unpack this, this kind of conversation further, I would love to do that with you. But many of us might be familiar with uh, the story of Jonah. It's about the prophet Jonah who, who part of the story gets swallowed by a fish and survives in it for three days before getting spit up to fulfill his mission. And whether you're aware of this or not, for, for some people, um, maybe outside of the Christian faith or even within, it begs the question, did, did it happen exactly that way? But wherever you stand on that debate, whether or not Jonah literally was swallowed by and survived in the fish for three days does not change the truth of that story that declares that God's mercy and grace extends even to Israel's enemies. In fact, it's interesting to consider that potentially the author of that story may have believed in the power of that timeless truth so strongly, so significantly, that they wanted to, to tell the biggest tale, maybe even the biggest fish tale, to make sure that that point was not missed. Once again, um, this characteristic of the Bible parallel, is paralleled a little bit in the life of Jesus. Now, now don't get me wrong. What I'm not saying is that the, the, the Bible is not a legitimate historical document. The vast majority of the scriptures, the pages of scriptures, are well verified by modern discovery, which helps give it its credibility. Um, and that's especially true about the historical person of Jesus. Um, but even when it comes to the gospel accounts of Jesus, uh, we actually have four of them. Uh, four different accounts and biographies describing the life of Jesus, all from four different vantage points, each having a few varied details. They're, they're often described as the gospel according to their writer. But here's the thing. 
Each one of them unequivocally testifies to the, to the life and the person and the teaching and the work of Jesus, ultimately giving his life for God's kingdom of love and witnessed as rising again to unleash God's love on the world. And in those gospels, we, we even see Jesus himself uh, leveraging the power of truth that transcends fact and fiction in the way he used metaphors and fables and stories, what we often call parables, uh, to teach his followers. His friend Matthew uh, described Jesus' teaching this way once. He said, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. Because what we see in Jesus, what we see in the Bible when we study, study it holistically is that the truth of the Bible transcends fact and fiction and helps us experience its timeless truth even in any parts of it that at times may seem more like fiction than fact. So first, the Bible is holy and human. Second, the Bible navigates science and story. Third, uh, the Bible transcends fact and fiction. Uh, and then the fourth key learning, and this is actually a summary of what was the fourth and fifth weeks of our Bible study series. Uh, the fourth learning is that the Bible provides application and rationale more than rules and answers. The Bible provides application and rationale more than rules and answers. I think when we come to the Bible, you know, seeking guidance for our lives, for which it, it does provide, Sometimes I think we hope that the Bible would provide us kind of a step-by-step -step instruction manual for life or a rule that can address any and every situation. But the reality is when we uh, read and study the Bible thoroughly, it, it just doesn't do that. Let me give you one kind of obvious example of that in the Bible. Um, I want you to imagine for a moment that uh, you're dealing with a, a difficult coworker at work who's been acting kind of foolishly in a way that's frustrating you, frustrating some of your other coworkers. Um, it's not going well for the company. It's kind of reflecting badly. And, and your, your boss isn't noticing and not doing anything about it. And you're not sure what you should do. So you want to turn to the Bible for help. So you, um, you type into Google how to deal with a foolish coworker Bible verse. And uh, sure enough, you're in luck. Search result comes up. The first search result, it comes from the wisdom book of Proverbs in Proverbs 26, verse 4. So you click on it, you check it out. And Proverbs 26, 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to their folly, or you yourself will be just like them. So you think, ah, okay. You take a breath. You say, okay, I, I don't need to step in here. I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to get caught up in the drama or I'm going to become foolish myself. I'm going to trust that this will play out over time. My boss will notice. Things will get dealt with. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. Thank you, Bible, for your guidance. Um, but then you happen to notice that the second search result actually showed Proverbs 26, verse 5. Uh, the very next verse, you think, well, I might as well keep reading and, and get a little more guidance for, for this situation. So you read Proverbs 26, verse 5, that says this, Answer a fool according to their folly, or they will be wise in their own eyes. Say, wait, what? What am I supposed to do here? Bible search result number one said, don't answer. Kind of stay away from that situation. Bible search result number two says, you better answer. Or this person's going to become wise in their own eyes. They're going to find a way to, to run the company. They're going to run everything to the ground. We're all going to lose our jobs. Like, Bible, what are you saying? What am I supposed to do? Right? And maybe that example feels, you know, a little bit extreme. Maybe sounds ridiculous, although it's from the pages of Scripture. It could be about a real scenario in our lives. And it's because it's, it's one of the most obvious examples, maybe especially in the wisdom book of Proverbs, of how... The Bible tends to provide rationale and application of, of offering wisdom and discernment in our lives um, more than just the clear rule for every situation we might face. In fact, the Bible tends to uh, reveal its wisdom in what scholars call progressive revelation throughout the entirety of the scripture and throughout the pages of scripture over time. And we might even say 
beyond the pages of scripture. Or rather, Jesus said something to that effect um, with his disciples the night before he died. In John 16, Jesus said this to them. He said, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, more than I can say right now for you to hear and witness and one of you to write down later, to, you know, to be in the Bible for everyone else later, more than you can bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, who we understand to be God's Holy Spirit that Jesus has made available, he will guide you into all the truth. Jesus says that there's uh, more than we can uh, take even from what's written here. That by unleashing his spirit, God's spirit in combination with the revelation of scripture actually continually leads us into all truth, into God's wisdom and discernment so we can apply it to our lives for any situation we may encounter. Those are the, the four key learnings from our Bible study series. First, that the Bible is both holy and human, that the Bible navigates science and story, that the truth of the scriptures transcends, the Bible transcends fact and fiction, and that the Bible provides uh, application and rationale more than rules and answers. And these learnings have helped us learn how to navigate some of those tensions that may either make us want to dismiss the Bible or, or, or not engage with it, become illiterate to it, or to fight about the Bible on you know, a variety of those dimensions. But the actual point of our Bible study series, um, which actually gets to the point of the Bible, uh, came in the sixth and final week of the series, where based on the kind of the framework of all of those learnings, what we came to understand is that the point of the Bible is not actually the Bible itself, but the point of the Bible is actually Jesus, that the Bible is ultimately about Jesus. And that the point of our Bible study is not to be more studied in the Bible, but the point of Bible study is actually to encounter and come to know the person of Jesus, both in the scriptures and in his risen presence among us today. Jesus made this claim when he was uh, speaking to the most studied biblical scholars of the day, the people that wrote the book on Bible study of his time. He said to them, he said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them, in this book, you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, the person of Jesus, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Friends, may that never be the case of our Bible study. May we never miss the point of the Bible and why we'd study it to actually come to Jesus and experience him in the midst of this story and in these pages. Um, to try to help us not miss this, uh, the gospel writer John, he set the stage for, for, for this idea as he, was in, as he was introducing Jesus in the beginning of his gospel when he said, in the beginning was the capital W word. And the capital W word was with God and the capital W word was God. Listen to this. He was with God in the beginning. Friends, the capital W word of God is not actually a word at all. It's a person. And that person is named Jesus. And it's Jesus who uh, speaks the most clearest truth of God's word into our lives, both through the story of the scriptures and by his spirit among us today. Um, it's Jesus as the living word who speaks infinitely more clearly and accurately about what God has to say. Again, just one more time here from the scriptures. The scriptures seek to say this in their written word. In Hebrews 1 that I quoted earlier, reading, reading the, a few more verses here, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times in various ways. That's the, the human dimension of the scriptures. But in these last days, 
He has spoken to us by his Son, Jesus. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and listen to this, and the exact representation of God's being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Friends, Jesus is what God has to say. And Jesus is what the Bible has to say. And the point of the Bible is not the Bible itself. The point of the Bible is Jesus. And in case you missed it, um, the point of our Bible study series in 2015 and the point of any and all of our Bible study in 2023 is not about studying the Bible, but about getting to know and coming to and encountering the person of Jesus more and more. So what have we sought to do differently since our Bible study series? What's been the the legacy based on these learnings? Well, firstly, um, Anytime we engage the Bible, we, we read it, we, we teach from it, we, we talk about it, we listen to other people talking about it, we look for Jesus. We look for Jesus in and throughout the entire story. We look for the characteristics and qualities of Jesus, for the, the grace, the mercy, the compassion, uh, the justice, the righteousness, the humility and non-judgment. And here's the thing, when we uh, can't find Jesus, we can't seem to find Jesus in a particular passage or story, what we do is what the other thing the Bible helpfully provides, we look in the mirror of our humanity, um, our own sin and struggle that still plagues our lives today. And out of that, we actually recognize our need for a savior, the savior that we have in Jesus and that this story keeps pointing us towards even in our sin and our struggle. And then we seek to get to know that Savior and become more like that Savior, participating in his redemption of the world, inviting us into a life of loving God and loving others. Um, This also means we've learned that we we don't have to throw out any parts of the Bible. Um, When we face the, the difficult or challenging or sometimes ugly parts of the Bible, because of knowing and managing all these tensions, we don't have to throw them out. And we don't have to let our faith be thrown out or decimated by challenging parts of the Bible. And friends, there is a generation that needs to hear that and needs to know we can engage the Bible this way so they can follow Jesus with us as well. We've learned that we don't have to uh, keep fighting about different interpretations or perspectives on the Bible, especially along these lines of tensions we've talked about today. We've come to appreciate that there have been different interpretations about different aspects of scripture throughout the history of the church, and that is true in our generation as well. But as we put Jesus at the center of all of our Bible study, we learn to appreciate each other's perspectives coming towards Jesus at the center, and we learn from each other, and we grow together, and we love each other just as Jesus has invited us to do. I'm so glad for what God has done, has did and has done through our Bible study series eight years ago and what he continues to do in and through us because I've never been more passionate about reading and encountering and uh, experiencing and sharing about meeting Jesus in this book, in this story. And that's what we want to keep being about together as a community today. In case you missed it, that's what Bible study was all about, and that's what God is still up to in our community, helping us experience Jesus through the Bible. And as I close, um, I actually want to give us a couple of moments to uh, listen to, to, to read, and to reflect on some words here from the Bible together for you to experience that personally. Um, our bands can come get, come forward as they're going to uh, get settled for the music that will follow. Um, But what I want to do is read a passage for us. I'm going to read it three times. It comes from one of these passages, Hebrews 1, that I've referenced a couple of times, but we'll read just a a little bit of a fuller expression of it. And then we'll have a little bit of space between each reading to reflect and to listen for what Jesus might want to be saying to us, to our minds and our hearts and our lives right here and right now. Because we believe that... uh, in the way that these words are inspired, that God has also given us his spirit to speak by these words, 
between these words even beyond these words, directly to us right now. And that's why sometimes it's good to read scripture slowly and prayerfully, even repetitively. It's what we call an inspired reading of these inspired writings. Um, so I invite you to get comfortable. Uh, take a deep breath. If you want to close your eyes to just listen, you can do that. But the words will also be on the screen in a full screen here for you to, to, to read them as I read them over us. And let's listen for the word of God who is Jesus to speak to our hearts right now. Through the words of the Bible in Hebrews. Hebrews 1 verse 1 says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Coming out of this first time reading and hearing these words again, I invite you just to think about, or if you're scanning the words, to look for what word or phrase catches your attention. It's one of the words or phrases they're standing out to, and pay attention to that, notice that, and sit with that for a moment. read it for us again. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After this second reading, um, maybe related to whatever word or phrase was, was most catching your attention, I just invite you to think and, and reflect right now, what is Jesus saying to you through these words? What is Jesus saying to your heart about who he is? What is Jesus saying to you about the Bible and maybe how you've related to it or haven't and, and what he's inviting you to do next as it relates to his written word? Um, what is Jesus saying to you now? And one last time, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus, we thank you that you are what God has to say. You are the word of God who we can experience through these written words today. Would you speak to us now? We pray. Amen.